Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast, which is sponsored by My Financial Planner. Not knowing when you can afford to retire or what your pensions will provide can be worrying. My Financial Planner provides independent, fixed-fee retirement planning advice, bringing clarity to your financial future. At My Financial Planner, we build a retirement plan for you so you can retire with confidence and purpose. Find out more about getting a plan to fund the retirement you really want at myfinancialplanner.co.uk. I'm delighted to welcome back to the podcast today, pensions expert Sir Steve Webb. Steve appeared in episode 87 back in July to discuss state pensions in general and more specifically, his recent report that explores whether thousands of old women are being shortchanged on their state pension. You can find that episode on your preferred podcast player or on our website at theretirementcafe.co.uk. If you're not familiar with the name, Steve served as pensions minister in the coalition government of David Cameron for five years. In this episode, Steve and I discuss some of the major pension reforms he oversaw during his time with the DWP, including the success story that is also enrolment, what's worked about pension freedoms legislation introduced in 2015. Steve also shares the changes around pensions legislation he would love to see coming next and what his retirement might look like. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Sir Steve Webb. Welcome back to the podcast, Sir Steve Webb. Thank you. It's nice to be back with you. So, Steve, last time we touched on lots of topics, mostly about the state pension and your influence there and the changes that you brought in and then your your campaign about people who are not eligible or getting the right state state pension at the moment, which was really, really fascinating. What I'd like to move to, and we did touch on it last time, was um, auto-enrolment. You know, this is this system now that we're getting everyone into pensions and they're starting to contribute. Tell me about, tell me about your thoughts around auto-enrolment. I think it's been one of the biggest public policy successes of the last decade, probably, and, and I can't claim all the credit by any means because the, the momentum was already there when I started in 2010. And basically, it was a response to the fact that year after year after year, the proportion of people in the private sector with a pension was just going down, just remorselessly going down, because Companies had stopped automatically enrolling people when they joined into old-style company pensions, younger, newer workers. There was just, just nothing. It's just nothing was happening. And without that, without something, a whole generation would reach pension age, just un- unable to afford to stop work. And what auto-enrollment does, and it draws on American research, is switch the default round. So instead of the default being you don't have a pension, the default is that you do. Uh, and I should slap myself on the wrist for using the word default because that's I mean, real people don't think default's a good thing. But uh, the norm, the norm is that you have a pension. So you have a pension. Uh, so your employer chooses it for you and applies it to the whole workforce, essentially. So all you have to do is kind of turn up. As long as you're paid more than 10000 a year, the employer has a legal duty to put you in. They've got a few months to get it going. But once you're there, that's how it works. And unless you opt out, they put 3% in. You put 4% plus tax relief makes 5 so you get 8% ideally of your whole wage. It doesn't have to be the whole wage. It could be a band of your wage, but, you know, 8% is the sort of headline number. Now, that took a day turn and the Pensions Commission started it just after 2000. It, I came in in 2010. We finally started it in 2012 with the biggest firms in Britain, uh, and that rollout went on for five or six years down to the very smallest firms, putting tiny amounts of money in, and then once everybody was in, that was then stepped up to 5% and then 8%. So probably an eight-year rollout, something like that. And it's been a stunning success in the sense that opt-out rates the government thought would be about one in three. So when they did all the modelling, they thought one in three would opt-out. It's probably been more like one in ten. And that's been the real triumph. And young people are coming in, women are coming in, you know, all the sort of underrepresented groups. Now, there are still lots of emissions, you know, millions of self-employed, you know, people who don't earn 10,000, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I think this is a glass four fifths full, really. Yeah, yeah. And um, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a, it's a real success. Um, I've not been involved in putting these schemes in to, to companies myself. It's not an it's not a area that I work in. But obviously, I have to be knowledgeable about it. The, the one thing that does concern me a little bit about when I talk to people about their auto-enrollment scheme is they don't really understand it. Mm. They don't really get it. They 
choose the default fund, again, default word, um, they don't really understand what it's likely to give them. They're given projections that don't really mean anything. Again, as in, in our previous conversation, when you were talking about financial education, of, of being something something timely. Mm-hmm. The problem is, of course, is that the, pers- the time they're, they're going to um, engage with it is going to be too late. You know, the time, you know, when you get to 55, um, and you start to think, ah, you know, uh, 65 or 70 is not so far away any longer. I better take a look at um, what I've got. Um, an 8%, a 10% contribution of their salary may not be, have been significant enough to actually get them a, a, a good retirement income. Um, yeah. What, what, what do you, how, how, do we, how do we address that challenge? Yeah, I mean, I think... It's not quite as bad as that in the sense that if you can get a good, you know, get a decent job at 21, get it auto-enrolled for 30 years, and by the time you're 50, you know, you've got a reasonable pot of money there and you haven't had to decide, engage, or do anything. I'm a great fan of what they then call midlife MOTs, the sort of, you know, at 50, you review your finances, you review your career options, because if we, there's a book called The 100 Year Life, Yes. Uh, and it's very much that, you know, we're not going to have one career. We're going to have many. We're going to go in and out of different things. You have to retrain. So the, the, 50, the age 50 review, and maybe it should be 45, or yeah, you can argue about that, um, should be about more than money. It should be about, well, what's your next career going to be and what can you do now to train for that and transition to that and all of that. But I think 50-ish is the kind of age where people then, as you say, do start to look ahead to retirement and so on, but is far enough away still to material impact it. You know, if, if, if for today's 20-year-olds, their pension age is going to be 70, let's say, probably higher, then they're still 20 years away. But at 50, they're probably relatively close to the peak of their earnings potential. So they may have some discretionary cash. You know, kids may have left home, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so we certainly do need things to transition from this kind of very passive, inert, auto-enrolled population to an engaged pension freedoms world of choosing. Um, and therefore, I think triggers like turning 50, midlife reviews and all of that is probably the most important thing. You know, obviously paying for financial advice is great, but if people disengage, they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. The thing is, I suppose, that the, the biggest impact in someone's pension is the payment they make in their younger days. And in the old style, you know, I'm showing my age, but the old, you know, the, when people were contributing to um, defined benefit you know, if they're not in the in the public sector, obviously, but if they're in the private sector, the defined benefit schemes, you know, the contributions were bigger than the auto enrollment amounts, um, and they were linked to people's salaries early on, and they had a long time to build up a a, a slush fund. And I just think the, the the correct investment choice and the correct contribution choice, if people would engage in their twenties, I bet you know, I think you mentioned that you've got children of twenty years of age, and you will probably sit down with them and go, okay, let's have a look at this auto enrollment scheme. Let's actually make sure you are in the fund that's going to give you the greatest greatest um, possibility of success and return. Um, and and by the way, look, it looks like they'll match some contributions. There's a bit of extra free money in this employer, yeah. you know, and and you'll and you'll and you'll Im- impose possibly your views on them, and then <laughs> you know, and 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 maybe they'll listen. But but they'll be the lucky ones because I think the yeah. majority of twenty year olds don't have someone who is probably engaged in pensions as you as a, as a father. Yes, I, I'm not sure my kids think of themselves as the lucky ones, but <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I think. Um, you certainly made an important point there about matching. I think that is that is the one big gap. So yes, there's a legal minimum, but lots of people work for bigger firms, better firms who will go further. And if you put an extra pound in, they'll put an extra pound in and you get tax relief on your pound. So, you know, your ATP becomes two pounds and there aren't many ways you can invest money. So certainly just understanding what how much further your employer will go, that's, that's an absolute no-brainer, I think. Um, we... Um, uh, did actually come up with some sort of rule, rules of thumb, uh, uh, which was which we called um, do your sums, S-U-M-S. An S was start as soon as you can. U was up your contributions when you get a pay rise. An M was max out on what your employer will do. So S-U-M, do your sums, and S was right. to seek advice, obviously. So, uh, you know, and because actually at the DWP, we tried to think of these kind of five-a-day type rules it's incredibly difficult to come up with anything more specific than, than, you know, start early up when you can afford more and match like an employer. That seems, you know, if everybody did that, 
we'd be okay. Yeah. I think the other, the other thing worth saying is, you know, we can't forget the financial pressures on young people to do other stuff. You know, it's all very well saying, yes, you're 23, you should put, you know, 12% in your pension because it'll compound for 50 years. But if you're saving for a deposit, you know, actually is that marginal 4% going to go in the pension or the, or the deposit, you know, the lifetime ice or something. So again, I think overdoing the pressure on younger people, for me, if they go in at 8%, they don't opt out and they, you know, build on that, maybe sort out a house deposit and then maybe come back to the pension when they've got a bit more disposable cash. That, that's not a bad outcome, I think. Right, right. So moving from, obviously, from people, the, the populations all getting into pensions, we've also then got the flexibility now, pensions, freedoms are all getting out of your pensions. I mean, do you, do you feel that pension freedoms has, has been a success? I do. I mean, so people forget what we're comparing with. You know, they'll say, oh, there's this problem and there's that problem with pension freedoms. But of course, the pre-pension freedoms world essentially said, OK, you've got a tiny pot, take it as cash. You've got a big pot, draw it down with limits, talk to an advisor. But a whole bunch of middle England, if I can use that phrase, just stuck with buying an annuity. And annuity rates were coming down and down and down. We were asking people to put money into a pension to buy a product. And there's nothing wrong with an annuity per se, but we would get him to buy it at 55 or 60 or whatever that was going to last with us all living longer for 20, 30 years. And they were getting diddly squat. And so we're auto enrolling 10 million people into these pots of money type pensions overwhelmingly. And then having to say, but at the end, you have to buy this product that's very inflexible, potentially doesn't look like much return for you. And the joy of pension freedoms was to say, well, you can still do that. You can band annuities if that's right for you, but you can now do different stuff. And it is still the one thing that people walk up to me in the street and I often say, you know, shake me by the hand rather than by the neck. You know, it's the one where they say, do you know what, Steve? Because of those freedoms, I could. And then they'll tell me a story. You know, I got my pension income sorted. I, I'm married. Two state pensions, 18,000 quid. My wife's got a local government pension. I've got whatever. And then we could take this pot and we paid for, you know, my son's wedding, deposit on a house for my kids. Well, we just cracked it. We've just found something that makes pension saving attractive, makes DC pensions no longer the ugly duckling, but, but so attractive people are shoveling money out of their final salary pensions into DC because flexibility they really want. Yeah, no, there's an argument they shouldn't be. But, you know, so I, I think actually the principle that it's your money, because for so long HMRC said, no, we've given you tax relief, it's our money. We get to decide what you do with it. He's absolutely right. You know, yes, we need more safeguards, more advice, more guidance, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's not job done. But I'd far rather be in this world than the sort of straight-jacketed world we came from. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. And I think um, if people can make sensible decisions, it's the, uh, it's the people that we know that also are leaving significant amounts of money just in a cash fund. Yeah. And, you know, 10 years of a cash fund and it's just been eroded by inflation. And also not understanding the tax implications of spending all of their money. Um, and again, you know, I suppose uh, if we, if we, if the the government is um, generous to give us these huge tax reliefs, there has to be some kind of safeguarding around. I suppose I don't know from my perspective of, of what people do. There again, sometimes there's too much safeguarding. We were dealing with a scenario the other day where, you know, someone had got a. Thirty-one thousand pound pension pot with a with a small guarantee on, and had to take advice. Yeah. We were unwilling to do it because the cost of providing that advice was just crackers. I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to charge the client it. So therefore, I said I'd rather not do the business. Yeah. And they're sat there going, well, why can't I access my thirty-one thousand? Yeah. No. And that threshold, I think, is far too low. I mean, so you could have a sort of do what you like under 30 mandatory guidance with pension wise up to 60, 70, 80, whatever the number was. So, you know, we, and that's the dilemma, isn't it? You want, you want consumer protection, but you don't want rigidity, cliff edges, you know, and it's all, it's all a trade off. There isn't a perfect balance. I suppose on, on people putting money in cash, that's my biggest fear. You know, I mean, I was famous for remarking about Italian sports cars and, you know, the worry when pension freedoms came in was people would blow the lot on riotous living and then claim pension credit. And of course, that was never really the risk. The risk actually was people being ultra cautious. You know, they fixated by tax free cash, as people are, don't know what to do with the rest of the money, don't, but don't trust pensions. You know, I picked that up quite a lot. So I took the lot out and then I stuck the rest in my cash ice or on my current account. And the FCA rightly 
has tried to do something about people defaulting into cash. Um, but the FCA can't do much if you've actually taken the whole lot out, you know, no. if you literally just have the money. So I do, that's what worries me far more. And therefore more when people are trying to take the hundred percent out, especially of modest pots, much more nudges to stop them just, you know, frittering it away and re, you know, not, not on riotous living, but just on poor investment. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. It is, it is a concern. Now in what we have a, um, a paper that we read called Money Marketing, and you've just written an article in there about unretiring. Tell me more about that. Yeah, it was triggered by some academic research I saw a few years ago from Manchester University, and they found that, I forget the headline figure, it was something like one in four people some years after they apparently retire have then unretired. They've actually gone back to work in some shape or form. And you can kind of see a combination of factors there. So sometimes it's one partner retires, but the other one hasn't. And the retired partner quickly just gets bored and just thinks, well, I'm going to go back to work until we can both retire. Um, or somebody just loved what they used to do. They miss the workplace. They miss their mates. They miss the social contacts. You know, so there's kind of positive reasons for going back. Mm. There's obviously financial reasons. People just realize they can't actually afford and they have to do part-time work. But, you know, the scale of this is quite shocking, really. You kind of think retirement's retirement, and it turns out it isn't. And so I guess I link that then to the current crisis and the people who've got lots of money, pensions, close to retirement, early retired, or into retirement that's just crashed in value. And, you know, you'd hope it wasn't 100% on the single share in the FTSE. But, you know, you can see these pots have gone down pretty dramatically. And therefore, there may be people who've retired for whom the answer isn't eking out a minute withdrawal to try and give the funds chance to build again. He's actually just do a bit of work, do a bit of paid work. Now, you know, if you're not well, if you don't do a job that allows you to do that, that's difficult. You know, don't be glib about this. But there's a whole set of people who I think – the financial planning conversation is too often at risk of being about products and investments. And actually we have bigger choices to make. And one of them is, you know, things like I reached state pension age, I can take my pension, but I don't have to. So I can put it off for a year, carry on working, get a bigger pension when I do get it, have more money in my pot, you know, and, and that just needs to be part of the planning process. And I'm sure, it, you know, Sure, those are conversations you already have, but it just making people more aware. I think that the when do I retire? How much do I retire? Do I go back to work? Is part of the mix. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I think, of course, the big thing that we experience is that people have never have retired before. So when they get to retirement and they retire six months down the track, is not often exactly as they expected it to be. Yeah, um, and especially people who have retired in the last twelve months. You know that this is yeah. a you know this is not this is not what their plan was at all. So um, no, yeah, that's really interesting. I think I think the value of kind of pre-retirement courses is quite important as well. You know, you can hear from people who have been through it and come out the other end and tell you what it's like. Yes, yes. So um, I understand that you're in your um, mid fifties, uh, <laughs> possibly, and you're, and, you're now, and you're now you're now a partner at Lane Clark and Peacock. So you're obviously not not ready for retirement just yet, but what does retirement look like for you? I think it would have to involve keeping my brain busy for as long as I could. So uh, something I do in my spare time at the moment is is I volunteer with the Pensions Ombudsman Service, uh, and that's something perhaps I could do a bit more of in retirement. So basically, people have complaints. A full reference to the Ombudsman is a big thing. It takes a long time. There's a big backlog. So they have a group of people who've worked in the industry a long time who just take cases and try and sort them out. Right. So, you know, you read the paperwork, it kind of makes sense to you. You liaise with the pension provider, the pension company, whoever it is, and say, look, Mrs. Jones, I'm happy about this. I've read it and I think she's right or I don't think she's right, you know, and you try and resolve things informally. And that's quite interesting. And, you know, I had a lady who was a nurse and she'd been attacked at the hospital and couldn't work anymore and she'd been refused an ill health early retirement pension. And we complained under the process and she was turned down. And I went back to her and said, okay, I want you to write down for me what this means to you. So she wrote this piece and it said things like, I used to have long hair. I now can't lift my arms above my shoulders, so I can't wash my hair. So I've had to have my hair cut and I now have short hair. You know, stuff like that. So she fed in the kind of human side of it. I went through all the numbers and said, look, I think your statistics are wrong on all of this. And they've given her the ill health pension, you know, and her husband rang me up and said, I don't know who you are, mate. You know, I don't really know who you are. I just wish I could buy you a drink. You know, so, so that kind of, so I think volunteering, 
I do some debt advice. I've been trained to be a sort of FCA approved debt advisor. And again, just small numbers of people helping them to manage money. So I think I think retirement probably would involve that kind of volunteering, amongst other things, and reading and stuff like that. But um, but I'm not, as you say, I'm 54 and three quarters, so I'm not not quite ready yet. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose if you're in reasonable health, there's um, you know it could be another 50 years of, of life expectancy ahead of you. <laughs> Not the way I live, I don't think. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, I mean, you know, um, there is an issue about um, doing bits and pieces. So, you know, the nature of the work, I'm in the privileged position that I could probably find a role of, you know, a day a week or whatever it was, be on the board of something. And, you know, I realise that's a privileged position, but I probably could do that. And that would just kind of keep me in the world of pensions for a bit. I was told by a, a city headhunter that having a night of gave you an extra five years. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me a bit about the role at LCP. Well, it's been a, it's been a good transition. So I had four years at Royal London, who are very much a workplace a sort of DC defined contribution provider. LCP traditionally have been actuaries, have been advising big company pension funds. They currently advise you know multi tens of billions of pounds schemes. Moving into DC, so the more modern. Uh, they've got very good tech people who, so the, the, the website we had that's had all these visits was designed, one of my colleagues knocked it out in a day kind of thing. So uh, it's nice to work with folk who are kind of uber specialists. So everybody I talk to knows more about what they know about than I do, which means I'm always learning. And I kind of try and be the bridge between the specialists and the general public, the media, explaining what we're doing, what issues we found, hence this state pension campaign. And also fronting onto clients, onto regulators and government, really. So I'm still very much in the world I'm familiar with, just from a slightly different perspective. Yeah. And what would you like to see? Um, what what kind of legislation changes or changes around pensions uh, and retirement would you like to see um, coming into kind of government policy in the in the future? I suppose a, a soft one that's happening anyway, and then a hard one. The soft one is the pensions dashboard. This idea that there'll be a website where you can see, and in auto enrolment world where you have, you know, twelve jobs and twelve pensions, yeah, you do at least need to be able to see everything in one place. And that's progressing slowly. I'd right. love to see that, you know, uh, and we will get there. There is law going through Parliament at the moment, but it's been, you know, it's been manana for a long time. So it'd be nice to see that. The big prize would be tax, you know. I was the DWP pensions minister. I had no real say, with one exception, on um, pension tax relief because the Treasury guard tax. That's what they do. Mm. And nobody else's opinion really counts. And what we've seen is, as you well know, increased complexity, incremental change, shaving, caps, limits, tapers, thresholds, all that stuff. And I think what really needs is somebody a bit brave to sit down and say, well, what's this all for? What are we trying to achieve here? Rather than just trying to, you know, all right, let's decide how much money we want to spend on tax relief. And it might be less than we spend now, potentially. Are the right people getting it? Does it make sense for old DB, new DC, young, old? And just try and look at it once in the big picture. And there'll be a row and there'll be losers and all the rest of it. But if we could do that and then leave it alone, I think that would be a prize. And yeah. I'm available. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, the continual tinkering, obviously, to a certain extent, keeps me in work. Well, it did, yeah. But, but is just also a minefield. I mean, I remember when pen I, I was, remember doing my exams at, at the time around a pension simplification, and and I was being told by other people that I was wasting my time doing all these exams because, of course, it, it was all going to be so simple afterwards. Well. <laughs> Here um, we are. <laughs> here we are, a number of years later. But I do think that. I do think people do need some surety. They need some surety, the idea that the money that they put into a pension will, they, they, they know the terms it's going in on and then they know the terms that it's coming out on. Um, and this is where the distrust comes, I think, is that, well, you know, pensions are bad and pensions are good and well, I'm, it, I might still get tax-free cash or I might not get tax-free cash depending yeah. on the government of the day. Well, actually, we need to know, you know, the public need to know if I, if I do take a contract out and I do save for my future and not rely on the state, then you need to be honest with me and say, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll stand by the agreement. That's right. I mean, you know, you can never bind future governments, so you can't for sure say there is no chance that somebody will change it. But I do think if you have a coherent, broad, systematic look and establish a new system, you've got the best chance you've got of some sort of stability. I mean, you know, it's possible to overstate this. You know, your large majority of the general public is unaffected by any of this stuff. You know, they don't affect annual allowance limits, lifetime allowance limits, fixed protection. You know, the, the people that you and I 
deal with are, are very much generally at the extremes of, of, of all of this. So it's, it's possible, I think, to overstate the complexity. But as you say, something like tax-free cash, that really, really bothers people. I get letters every week on my weekly column from people saying, do you think they'll abolish tax-free cash in the budget or should I take my money out while I'm still, you know, and that, that constant speculation is really unhelpful, I think. Yeah, because it does drive behaviour, of course. You know, if you think that they're going to change the rules, you're going to say, well, sod it, I'll take it out and I'll put it in the ISA, as, as yeah. many people have done. Steve, it's been, once again, fascinating chatting to you. Um, before we go, can you just explain to listeners where they can get in contact with you or they can find out more about the work that you do? Yes, yeah, sure. So the, the Lane Clark and Peacock website is just LCP, Lama what is it? Lima Charlie Papa, lcp.uk.com. Slightly odd, lcp.uk.com. Uh, and there's also a link, if you go there at the moment, to the state pension calculator, so people can check the state pension issue we talked about last time. Uh, and I'm just steve.web at lcp.uk.com. Brilliant. Well, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. It's been great, uh, great chatting to you, and uh, hopefully I'll speak to you again soon. My pleasure. Thanks very much. So until next time, this is Justin King, helping you feel more informed in your retirement.